What's up, biology nerdlings? Today we're going to be talking about mutations and artificial selection, so let's get started. Genetic variation and mutation both play roles in natural selection, which we just got through speaking about. A diverse gene pool is important for the survival of a species and the changing environment. Basically, we need to have sex to increase genetic variation. Sex is a good thing, in some cases. An adaptation is a genetic variation that's favored by selection and is manifested as the trait that provides an advantage to an organism in a particular environment. We talked about the snowshoe hair. We also talked about the desert hair with the very long ears that allow for heat exchange and things like that. Those are adaptations that those animals have for the environments that they live in, like polar bears down here. Um, their hair allows them to blend into their environment. Uh, marine mammals have thick layers of blubber, which helps shield them from the cold. All of those are adaptations that have occurred through genetic variation through time to help those animals be better adapted to their environments. So in addition to natural selection, chance and random events can also influence evolutionary process, especially for very small populations. So if we have a really small population as far as chance goes, um, if something drastically changes. So for example, if we have a population, this is the example that Mr. Dennison likes to use, of 10 little furry cute bunny rabbits in a forest. We only have a population of 10. If a tree gets cut down and falls and whack, it takes out one rabbit. We just took out 10% of that population. We took out 10% of the gene pool. So that's going to have a very drastic effect on that population. So that's one of those random events that could occur that could influence evolutionary process. Maybe we took out the biggest, baddest bunny, so the population is going to decrease in size. Um, the opposite of that is the larger the population, the less significant events are going to have on them. So if we have a population of one million cute little furry bunny rabbits, and we go through the forest, tree gets cut, whack, and the tree falls on little Ed, not much is going to happen. It might traumatize his friend Bill. But nothing's really going to happen to the population as a whole. It didn't really affect the gene pool that much. Whereas if there are only 10 rabbits, one rabbit gets taken out, it's going to affect the gene pool. So that's where having a very small population comes into play. So there are different sources of genetic variation. We have mutations, gene duplication, and chromosome fusion, and those provide the raw material for evolution. And then meiosis, or sexual reproduction, it produces new recombinants of phenotypes upon which natural selection operates. So sexual reproduction allows us to have variation within a species. That's why we have different colors of hair, different colors of skin, different colors of eyes as humans. And then of course, you know, when we talk about plants, we have different types of, you know, colors of flowers within a species. All of those are phenotypes or what things look like. So there are different types of mutations that we're going to be discussing in this podcast. Most mutations are deleterious. These are some words you probably want to know because you might see them on tests. They're not technically biology words, but a lot of times they like to bring some upper level vocabulary. So deleterious means harmful. So most mutations are deleterious, harmful, as well as recessive, meaning they're not the dominant trait. Obviously, mutations occurring in somatic cells do not affect future generations. And if you remember, you're kind of like, somatic cells, I've heard it, don't remember it. Somatic cells are our body cells. So it's basically saying that mutations that occur in our body cells aren't going to affect our future generations. My skin is not going to be reproducing, you know. My sex cells, however, so for me, my eggs, uh, if you're a guy, your sperm, those are your gametes or your sex cells. If a mutation occurs in one of your gametes, so for me, my eggs, for my guys, your sperm, if a mutation occurs in your gamete, then that can get passed on to the future generation. Occurs in a somatic or body cell, not going to get passed on. If it occurs in a gamete, it can get passed on. Uh, mutations can occur at either the gene or the chromosomal level. So the first type of mutation we're going to discuss is a point mutation. Now, we can classify these as synonymous or non-synonymous. And make sure you guys know all of these different vocabulary words, synonymous, non-synonymous, 
uh, missense, nonsense. So it sounds like a bunch of nonsense right now, but you need to know about all the sense. So point mutations occur when one nucleotide is substituted for another. So the genetic code contains synonyms. And so that's the first type of point mutation we're going to talk about is synonymous. Um, and again, point mutation, one nucleotide is flip-flop for another. So maybe I have, we'll look at right here, we have T, T, T right here. Maybe I have T, C, T or T, A, T now. So it's a very small point, meaning it happens at one point mutation. So synonymous, that's going to be okay. Uh, genetic code contains synonyms, meaning the same. And those are going to code for the same amino acids. So for example, DNA codons of GGA, GGG, GGT, GGC, those all code for the same amino acid, proline. So that type of mutation is called synonymous or a silent mutation. And make sure you know both because I don't know what you're going to get on your exam. It might say silent mutation. It might say synonymous. It might say just point mutations in general. So just make sure you know all of that terminology. But again, if there is a point mutation that occurs, but the same amino acid is still coded for, it's synonymous. It's not going to do any harm. Everything goes on. Business is normal as usual. All right. So the second type is going to be non-synonymous or a missense mutation. Uh, missense mutations can affect the protein in one of three ways. First of all, it can result in the protein that doesn't function as well as the original protein. That's what happens most of the time. Um, second, it could result in a protein that functions better than the original protein. Doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, you know, hey, we get, you know, some good luck. Or three, it can result in a protein that functions like the original protein. And it's because the R groups are similar, both polar or both nonpolar. Um, so again, our point mutation would take place here. So we have TTT. So right here, synonymous, we have uh, right here TTC instead of TTT, but it still codes for the same amino acid. Over here, the non-synonymous, it's no longer going to code for the same amino acid. And that's where we get something happening and the protein itself is going to change. So gene duplication can occur. Gene duplicated, and it's occasionally the duplication moves a gene from one chromosome to another chromosome. So it's duplicated, kind of we made a copy, cut, paste, bam. Um, each gene will accumulate different mutations, altering that protein um, that's subsequently synthesized or subsequently made. So the word synthesis, put together. Myoglobin is a protein that bonds with oxygen in our muscles. This gene has been duplicated and modified many, many times. And it's also given rise to the hemoglobin gene. So we have what we call neutral mutations. These are naturally evolving proteins that gradually accumulate mutations while continuing to fold in stable structures. So very, very slow, very long, um, again, neutral, and they're naturally evolving proteins. Uh, this process of neutral evolution is an important mode of genetic change, and it forms the basis of molecular clocks. So cytochrome C is a small protein found on the mitochondrial membrane. And between mammals and reptiles, there are 15 amino acids or mutations. So we use this cytochrome C to basically kind of clock out, and that's why we call it a molecular clock with cytochrome C, kind of how fast evolution is occurring. So changes in cytochrome C. So looking up here, we have a comparison of ancestral cytochrome C and human cytochrome C. The gene has been highly conserved and is a protein used in the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. So that's why there's not a lot of change because we all have to go through the process of cellular respiration uh, that takes place in our mitochondria. Uh, missense mutations occur more frequently in pseudogenes, and pseudo means false. So those are genes that have been duplicated, then they're mutated, but they're really no longer functional. Um, so that's kind of what's going on. So looking here at this cytochrome C comparison, we have a dash that indicates the amino acid is the same one found in that position in the human molecule. So looking at this, all vertebrate cytochromes, which are the first four, vertebrate means they have a backbone, uh, the human, the pig, the chicken, and the dogfish shark, all are going to have the same 
first four, starting with glycine. Um, Drosophilia, which are fruit flies, weed, and yeast cytochromes, also have several amino acids that actually precede that, and they're shown by the little arrows right here, so meaning there's something that comes before. So this is just showing the number of mutations that occur. Um, looking at the hemoglobin comparison right here, it's a comparison between the differences in the amino acid sequence of human hemoglobin with different species. So the last three species right here don't have a distinction between their alpha and beta chains. And we'll get to alpha and beta chains when we get more into biochemistry. So for now, I just want you focused on the difference. So there is only one difference in the amino acid sequence between us and a gorilla and our cytochrome C. Between us and a gibbon is two. Between us and a dog, 15. Between us and a frog, 67. So you kind of get the point. So here's just another representation of that type of data. We have our human here. There's eight differences in the macaw. There are 32 in the dog, 45 in a chicken, 67 in a frog, and 125 with a lamprey. So the further and further we go down, the more differences there are going to be. So the next type of mutation we're going to discuss is a frame shift. So our first was a point mutation. Second, we're describing our frame shift mutation. So frame shift mutation occurs as a result of either an insertion or a deletion of a nucleotide. So we're either putting something in, which is going to skew everything, or we're taking something out, which again is going to skew everything. So this changes the amino acid sequence of the protein from that point forward. So for example, if I have A, B, C, and I have a deletion of C, I'm going to go A, B, D doesn't really make sense anymore. Um, if I have A, B, C, and then all of a sudden I have an insertion of Z there and I go A, Z, B, again, it's not going to make sense because we have inserted or deleted something and it's completely shifting the entire sequence from that point on. So we have chromosomal arrangement. There's also been major changes in chromosome structure that result in changes within populations which can, in turn, result in the emergence of new species. Um, different types of chromosomal arrangements are inversions, deletions, duplications, translocations, and fusion. So inversion, we get flip-flop. Deletion, we're taking something out. Duplication, it's a copy-paste type thing. Uh, translocation, they're getting moved from one part to another. And then fusion, we have two fusing together. So comparing the karyotype of humans, which are denoted by the H's, so all of the H's are going to be human chromosomes, all of the C's are going to be chimpanzee chromosomes, and we're going to compare those. So again, a karyotype, if you re recall from freshman biology, that's going to be when we lay out all of the chromosomes, kind of like a chromosome map, so we can see where any of mutations occur. So if you look right here, great apes have 24 chromosomes, whereas us humans, we only have 23. Now the reason for that is the second chromosome right here, we had a fusion that occurred. So in all of the great apes, they actually have three at this location, whereas we only have two. Now for us, these two chromosomes right here would have fused, forming one, which gives us 23 pairs instead of 24. So we're gonna move on to artificial selection. So artificial selection is when humans manipulate a gene pool. And there are often consequences in such uh, manipulations. Some good can come out of it. So some of the things that we've created, which we use a lot, are our manipulations of our food sources. So we artificially select for a different trait. Um, one of those, did you know? From wild mustard, we have cultivated and artificially selected for different traits and come up with broccoli by suppressing flower development cabbage by suppressing the inner node link, kale, which is the enlargement of our leaves, uh, kurabi, which is the enhancement of the lateral meristems, cauliflower by sterility of the flowers. So all of those have come from a wild mustard plant. So antibiotics and antibiotic resistance are things that you hear a lot in the news. And antibiotic resistance has occurred a lot because of artificial selection. So when antibiotics are applied to a population of microorganisms or bacteria, 
to treat an infection, some of those bacteria are going to be naturally immune to that drug, so a very tiny percentage. Why? Well, because a random mutation has occurred, being, and it makes them immune to that. Um, it occurred in the genetic code, and it basically confers resistance. So we take an antibiotic, kills everything except maybe you know 1%. Well, guess what? That 1% of bacteria continues to reproduce, and we get a larger population of bacteria. So those continue to flourish and grow. So the only remaining option is for a doctor, physician, to prescribe you a second type of antibiotic and hope that the bacteria infection that you have isn't resistant to that antibiotic as well. So the increase in antibiotic resistant bacteria has caused many physicians and doctors to reduce the number of prescriptions that they write for antibiotics in general. Uh, one of the things that happens, I mean, people go to a doctor when they feel sick. Well, a lot of times when you go to the doctor, you feel sick, you have a viral infection. Viruses are not living. Therefore, an antibiotic, anti-life, is not going to kill a virus because a virus cannot be killed since it is not living. So you go in and, you know, you're kind of coughing, things like that. A lot of times the doctor will be like, well, you know, I'm going to prescribe an antibiotic just in case. Well, if you're taking those antibiotics just in case and you don't actually have a bacterial infection, you might start building up resistant bacteria in your body. And you'll develop a resistance to that antibiotic, meaning it will no longer work for different types of infections that you get. So it's always a good thing to know that you actually have a bacterial versus a viral infection. And that's something you might want to ask when you do go to the doctor. About 70% of pathogenic bacteria are resistant to at least one antibiotic, and those are called superbugs, or MDR bacteria, multi-drug resistant. So something that has been in and out of the news a lot in the probably past decade has been MRSA, um, hospital infection, superbug, or methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus. Um, multi-drug resistant bacteria don't respond to the first line of antibiotics. So basically we give you a broad spectrum antibiotic, hope it kills everything, but it doesn't. So now we're going to have to specialize and give you a very specific antibiotic that targets a specific type of bacteria. Uh, the types of bacteria that are most commonly found in hospitals are the ones that are the very resistant ones. You kind of pick them up. It's called a secondary hospital infection. You go there with one thing and you come out with three others. Um, some of the symptoms include skin boils, uh, similar lesions, and they don't heal very well. Uh, Multi-drug resistant bacteria can also attack internal organs upon gaining entry into the body. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes there is no antibiotic that will kill that bacteria. Uh, you kind of have to just write out the infection. Uh, a lot of people die from this. So, you know, antibiotic resistance is kind of a big thing right now. So. You know, that's one of the things, like I said, in the news, we have MRSA going on. Uh, you want to be very careful about taking antibiotics. Obviously, doctor prescribes you antibiotic, you need to take it. But you do want to make sure that you have an anti or a bacterial infection, and that's something you might want to ask them. So I'm going to leave you with my little, my little cartoon right here. It's like, psst, psst. hey kid, you want to be a super bug? Stick some of this under your genome. Even penicillin won't be able to harm you. So right down here it says, It was on a shortcut through the hospital kitchens that Albert was first approached by a member of the antibiotic resistance. Well, I hope you learned something about mutations as well as artificial selection. If you'd like to rewatch this video or many more for AP Biology and AP Environmental Science, you can go to my website at nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off for today. Stay nerdy till next time.